How's it going everyone? I hope you're all doing good. Welcome to this study session in which we will be looking at the bones of the arms. Now before we delve into this, I want to take a minute to discuss what we covered in the last video, which was the shoulder girdle. If you have watched that video, which I recommend you do before watching this one, then you will know that the shoulder girdle is made up of two bones, the scapula and the clavicles. Now as discussed in that video, the scapula are floating bones. They are not directly connected to the trunk of the body. Instead, they are connected to the clavicles and it's the clavicles that act as a strut for the scapula, preventing them from moving too much. Now, the reason why I am reiterating all of this is because the scapula is the root of the arm. As mentioned in the previous video, there is the glenoid cavity at the sides of the scapula that articulates with the head of the humerus, and the humerus is the first bone in the arm. Now you'll see in a moment as we start to look at all of this how the shoulder girdle allows the arms to function properly, therefore it's inevitably going to come up often when we study the arms. The shoulder girdle is where the arm starts and therefore the shoulder girdle changes its position depending on the arm's movement. And as I noted in the last video, we will look at the movement of the shoulder girdle as we continue to study the arm. Now for the purpose of these videos and to avoid some confusion, I'm going to make a separate video, potentially after this one, on the arm's movement. And so in this one, I'm going to discuss the structure of the arm. So starting from the top, the first bone that connects to the scapula is the humerus. The humerus is the long bone in the upper arm and it is in fact the biggest bone in the arm. Here in my sketchbook, I'm going to begin drawing this in context with the rest of the body before then isolating this bone and drawing it on numerous angles. Now the humerus looks fairly simple, right? In fact, it appears to be the type of cliche shape you imagine when you think of the word bone. It's a very important bone though, as it's in charge of connecting the arm to the body. The upper part of the humerus connects to the scapula and the lower part connects and takes care of the forearm's movement. I'll discuss these connections in a moment, but first let's draw out the humerus and look at it in detail. So from top to bottom, firstly we have the head of the humerus, this is what articulates with the glenoid cavity of the scapula. Its shape is rather spherical and as I said, we'll look at that connection between the scapula and the humerus in a moment. There is the anatomical neck of the humerus and as the name suggests, this is a constricted part of bone that connects the head and the body of the humerus. It encircles the head of the humerus. Next we have the greater and lesser tubercle and these are the small protrusions near the head of the humerus. There is then the body of the humerus, this is of course the long tubular section of the bone. At the bottom there is the condyle, this is the broader end of the bone that articulates with the head of the radius, forming a joint that I will discuss later. So that's some of the anatomical details regarding the humerus, before we move on to the bones of the lower arm, let's review that connection between the humerus and the scapula. I'll just quickly highlight the humerus on the illustrations above. Where the head of the humerus meets the glenoid cavity of the scapula, there is a joint referred to as the glenohumeral joint. This is a ball and socket joint and here I'm drawing a detailed close-up view of this connection. But next to this, I'll also create a more simplified illustration that does well to describe this. The glenoid cavity, or the sockets on the scapula, are faced to the side, and the humerus is similar in shape to a lowercase letter R connecting to them. As I mentioned earlier, I'll be discussing movement in a separate video, and I'll probably do the same for the types of joints that exist as well, because after all, it's those joints that allow movement. And don't forget it's movement and function that is responsible for the structure of the bones we are covering here. So now let's take a look at the bones in the lower arm, because whilst you might at first assume there is only one bone, similar to the humerus here, there is in fact two bones, the radius and the ulna. 
these two bones work together allowing the forearm to move the way that it does. Again here I'll draw these in context with the rest of the body in case you are not sure where your forearms are and then I'll draw them in isolation. So what I'm going to do is take a look at each of these bones in isolation before putting them back together. Starting with the ulna, here I'll draw this out on numerous angles as I typically do. The ulna is the longer bone in the forearm and it articulates with the humerus to perform flexion slash extension movements. The upper end of the bone where it meets the end of the humerus is a lot thicker in comparison to the lower end as it approaches the wrist and gets a lot thinner. I'll do the same with these and label some of the anatomical details. Near the elbow, so starting from above here, the ulna has two curved processes. And just like the acromion process on the scapula, we can assume that these are sections of bone that stick out. Firstly, there is the olecranon process. This is that pointy part on top. It's that bone that we feel at the tip of our elbow when we bend our arms. And this touches a section of the humerus called the olecranon fossa. I'll put some images on screen that shows this connection, but I'll probably draw some close-ups soon. Next, there is the coronoid process, which sounds similar to the coracoid process on the scapula, but this is called the coronoid process, and this is the triangular section that extends out. Now, these two processes form a large depression in the bone, which is referred to as the trochlear notch. When I was reading Stonehouse's anatomy book, he compared this to the shape of a bed opening its beak. This notch hooks onto the bottom of the humerus. Now the body of the ulna is triangular in cross section and as I mentioned earlier, the bone becomes thinner as it approaches the wrist. At the bottom of the bone, there is the head of the ulna. This can often be seen on the body and you can probably feel it with your hand now. It's the small bumpy bit of bone that can often be seen when the forearm is in a position where the two bones overlap. We'll discuss that when we talk about how these bones move. Finally, there is the styloid process and this is found at the distal end of the ulna in the forearm. Here to the side, I'm also going to make some additional notes to help myself remember some of these features, such as the trochlear notch and that styloid process. So that is the ulna, now let's take a look at the next bone in the forearm that is the radius. As I said, I'll look at both of these on their own for now and then we can put them together and also look at them in context with the rest of the body. Now the radius, unlike the ulna, actually gets thicker towards the wrist and this is because it's actually holding onto the wrist. You might have noticed that this bone is also curved, which will make sense once we place it next to the ulna. It's curved like this to avoid colliding with it in certain positions. Firstly, at the top, near the elbow, there is the head of the radius. This attaches and articulates with the capitulum of the humerus, forming the humeradial joint. So that's the radius meeting the humerus, but then also at the head of the radius, there is the articular circumference, and this touches the ulna, creating a pivot type joint referred to as the proximal radio-ulna joint. And altogether, these two joints form the elbow joint, and we can look at how this functions soon, as well as getting a much clearer understanding of it when we look at movement. Under the head of the radius, there is the neck of the radius, and just under this neck, there is what is referred to as the radial tuberosity. This is an elevated area of the bone, and although we are yet to cover the muscles, it might be good to know that this provides an insertion area for the biceps muscle. There is the body of the radius, the long tubular part of the bone, and again, this is triangular in cross section. I make a note of this for both because that's useful to be aware of when drawing. Finally, at the bottom, there is the styloid process. This again is another projecting section of bone. Now it's useful to know that this is always on the side of the thumb. It curves around the carpal bone for the wrist. 
And again, I'm going to make some notes here to highlight certain features that are worth remembering. So those are the anatomical details regarding the ulna and the radius. Now, as I said, I'm going to draw these two together, but we'll only be able to go over so much in this video without understanding movement. That's something that I'm going to focus on in the next video. Right now, I'm drawing the forearm as it is on a standard anatomical position, the same as I've done for the other views, showing these bones in context with the body. The standard anatomical position consists of the body standing upright facing forward with the legs parallel to one another and the arms and hands at either side with the palms facing forward. And in this position the bones for the forearms are parallel but in the next video we'll look at how they articulate with each other when in other positions. We'll also look at how the position of the arm affects the shoulder girdle as well. I'm unsure at this time how I'll tackle that, maybe I'll need to do a few separate videos to go over everything clearly, but anyways, here I have drawn the ulna and the radius together on a front, back and side view. I'm also going to create another drawing of the entire arm, showing all of the bones that we've looked at today. Again, this is drawn in an anatomical position. You can see the arm in context with the rest of the skeleton. What we have looked at today, including the shoulder girdle, is often referred to as the upper limb. Of course, there is also the hand that we'll be adding onto this at a later date. Next to this, I'm also going to create some drawings that describe the joint between the ulna and the radius. As mentioned earlier, this is called the proximal radio ulna joint. It's a pivot joint that allows these bones to articulate with each other. Then there is the humeroidal joint that connects the forearm bones to the humerus. And the names of these joints are easy to remember if you can remember the names of the bones. I'll probably be referring back to these pages often as I progress forward. But now I'm going to conclude this one here. I hope you enjoyed this one and found it useful. If you did, then please give the video a like. And with that being said, thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one. If you enjoyed the content I create, then do consider becoming a patron on Patreon. You will gain access to exclusive tutorials, study documents, process papers, real-time drawing footage and more. Plus, you will also be supporting me in a more personal way. Other than that, thank you for watching this video and I'll see you soon.